Welcome, everyone. I'm Dan Murphy. I'm executive director of the Masavar Romani Center for Business and Government. And I'm here today to welcome Dr. Scott Kennedy. Scott is the senior advisor and trustee chair in Chinese business and economics at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Scott writes on many topics, usually in the areas of industrial policy, technology innovation, business lobbying, and US-China commercial relations. I can't recite his full bio to you, but let's say it's long and illustrious. Uh, he's had many books and publications. He has edited or written on China's high tech drive, China's state capitalism, philanthropy, and much more. His popular writing appears in places like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Foreign Affairs, and Foreign Policy. But instead of telling you about all of that, which you can read online, I want to tell you that Scott is a true China Watcher's China Watcher, someone who people in the community, whether they're in China or the United States, look to for rigorous data-driven analysis that is also informed by his deep on-the-ground experience. In fact, Scott has been traveling to China for many decades. Uh, that experience was highlighted, in my mind, most recently by a trip he took to China for six weeks during September and October. This was, for those of you who, who are aware of China's COVID policies, this was during quarantine, uh, and Scott had to quarantine for quite a bit of time. I think he'll probably touch upon that in his, uh, in his comments. Uh, on a personal note, I first met Scott during the 2006-2007 academic year in Nanjing, China, when he came to the Hopkins Nanjing Center. And I was uh, lucky enough later to be one of the administrators running a program called the Public Intellectuals Program, which Scott participated in from 2008 and 2010. Uh, so his presence here has led me to reminisce on that trip. I still remember being in Chongqing uh, with Scott and enjoying some, some hot pot there. Um, every time I talk to Scott, I learned something new. And that's why... I've invited him here today and why I've invited him. This is, I was thinking back, this is now my third time inviting Scott to speak. Uh, the first time was at Yale Center Beijing during the early years of that institution. Um, the second time uh, was uh, four or five years ago when we invited Scott to speak at the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies. And uh, the third time, of course, is today. And as I said, I keep inviting him back because I always learn something new and I'm sure that you will as well today. His talk is entitled Xi Jinping's About Face, Implications for China's Economy, Politics, and Relations with the West. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Scott Kennedy. Well, thank you, Dan, uh, and thank all of you. Uh, I'm really appreciative for those very kind opening remarks. Um, and, um, that you've still been willing to, to invite me to future events I find shocking. Uh, but I hope that people here today don't walk away with my own sense of pessimism about my own abilities and things. But I, uh, you all have a great resource in Dan Murphy and uh, it's, a, it's a mutual admiration society. And um, I'm really appreciative for uh, this invitation, this opportunity to talk to everybody. And I wanna say thank you to uh, the Mosvar Raman Center, uh, Fairbanks Center as well, and the Raj Rajawali Foundation Institute for Asia. I think the three are uh, co-hosting today's talk. What I wanted to do um, is to make sure that we've got enough time for conversation. Uh, and so um, I was an academic for 50, 15 years uh, before I went to CSIS. And so I could talk for hours without pausing. I'm really good at that. Uh, but uh, having been at CSIS for a while now, I realize I actually need to talk in shorter sentences and then actually have a conversation. That's what I really want to do. Because I think um, it'll be, uh, I've heard myself uh, talk before, but what I really want to do is learn from, from the rest of you. And whatever we don't uh, discuss today, please be sure to follow up. Because uh, these are issues which are, are not going away. Uh, I work in a DC think tank, uh, but I don't want to give a DC think tank talk because I think that would be standard analysis. 
uh, which you can get uh, in commentaries off our website or um, uh, from, from any other think tank's website. Um, instead, I wanted to talk to you about uh, recent experience that I had in collaboration with a professor at Peking University, Wang Ji Su, uh, to uh, try and reestablish uh, normal people to people connections between the United States uh, in China, which for the last three years and to this very day are not where they were before. And we are not anywhere close to a normal situation, even though we've got plenty of visitors here uh, from China and there are some Americans who are heading back to, to China. But in any case, um, so Wang Ji Su, who is a professor at the uh, School of International Studies at Beida and I decided to take each other hostage um, to, to have our two trips tied intimately with each other so that they were both successful and that we could highlight the importance of in-person field work and research and people-to-people -people exchanges, uh, as well as push forward the conversation about US-China relations uh, since uh, in our view, uh, although the lack of communication didn't cause the relationship to decline, the lack of communication is an absolute obstacle to the improvement of the relationship. Uh, and so uh, we, last year, um, both took uh, trips. Um, we hosted Wang Ji Su in February and March uh, last year. Uh, which included a, a visit that he paid to Harvard toward the end of the trip. Some of you here got, had a chance to meet him. I'll tell you, in Washington, D.C., he was like a glass of cool water uh, given to someone walking through a desert. Uh, he was extremely thoughtful. People really benefited uh, from seeing him, uh, uh, and he came away learning a lot. Uh, my first effort to go to China as the, on the return trip was uh, last April. I got all the way to San Francisco uh, and um, got an email. U.S. government had made an announcement that going to Shanghai would be a bad idea because of, of the lockdown. So I decided uh, I was not going to go home, uh, mainly because uh, my wife didn't want me to. Uh, I had spent two plus years at home with her and she was sick of me. Uh, and so I had to think of something to do instead of going home. So uh, I went to Taipei, uh, Seoul, and Tokyo uh, for five weeks. Uh, got to quarantine in Taiwan first, uh, and, and then in Japan at the end, um, and had, had terrific meetings to learn how those three societies look at US-China relations and we're dealing with COVID uh, and, and everything else. Really uh, fantastic trip. Uh, unexpected, but um, still uh, amazing. Uh, a lot of the best things in life are unexpected, right? Um, went home, did my laundry, repacked, uh, then tried to fly to Shanghai, back to Shanghai, and Chinese government decided to cancel my flight because previous United flights had had COVID cases. And as a result of that, uh, their circuit breaker system meant that they would cancel flights. Uh, again, uh, in the best interests of my wife and our relationship, I decided I would fly to Taiwan again. Uh, so went back to Taipei, quarantined in Taiwan, uh, at this, not 10 days, this time only three, uh, and then flew, to, flew directly to Beijing, 10 days of quarantine in Beijing, uh, and then I was out on the streets uh, in China. So April 7th left my house in Falls Church, Virginia, September 17th, got out on the streets in Beijing, a short 163 day trip from my home to Beijing, a little bit longer uh, than usual. Uh, I had up here before, as maybe some of you saw as you were getting your lunches, uh, pictures from the trip, happy to share more of those. Uh, but I didn't want to just have this be a tour, a trip about tourism and things, but uh, it is kind of, you know, traveling is still a weird thing. Uh, it is a unique thing now, and I wanted to share uh, my experiences uh, about this trip uh, and then what the reaction to the trip and then what has happened in China since. Um, the talk, the title of today's talk is Xi Jinping's About Face. There's really two 
potential about faces. There is the policies that Xi Jinping implemented in the years after he took power. Uh, and then there's the policies of the last few months. Uh, both of those could be seen potentially as about faces. The, from Hu, Hu Jintao to Xi Jinping, that transition, and then what we've seen over the past few months. And I want to talk about both of, of those things and whether we ought to think of those as about faces or think of them in other ways. And, and then what the implications of that mental exercise is. Uh, I spent uh, 26 days altogether in quarantine. I'll tell you, it's not good for your health. Um, and I just, I, people sent me videos to exercise and, and Pilates and stuff. It doesn't, it doesn't work, at least not for me. I have no discipline. So, um, but nevertheless, I got through it. Um, and I can, I now can compare quarantines of multiple countries if you're really interested. Uh, but when I got to China, um, I received uh, as good a welcome as, as Wang Jisoo did in the United States. Uh, I had 105 meetings over the six weeks I was uh, in China. Um, this was the after the summer, spring and summer lockdowns. So Beijing operated relatively normally while I was there. When I went down to Shanghai, again, relatively normal. Uh, I left just as the 20th Party Congress was getting started. Uh, and then before the protests and the exit of zero COVID. So I was able to observe daily life, politics, the economy, the present, what it, uh, you know, foreigners' lives in China, uh, issues regarding US uh, China relations. Um, you know, since the, since the trip, uh, they finished the 20th Party Congress, um, which Xi Jinping, uh, you know, ran the table on. Uh, there was the Bali meeting between uh, Biden and Xi exiting a zero COVID, their China's charm offensive. Um, and so I want to explore all of that and try and, and explain what it, what it means uh, to, to all of us. And I'm going to do that through uh, the experience of my trip and then takeaways. So this is going to sound a little bit like field notes, but field notes are unique these days uh, because there's not a whole lot of people going uh, back and forth. Um, even though there are people on the ground uh, in, in both countries. But it is somewhat uh, unique, which is why we decided to do the trip in the first place. Um, so in terms of daily life in China, um, what I found is, is that everything uh, was dominated by the zero COVID policy. Um, the existence of this policy required the regimentation of every single person's life uh, in order to take tests every two to three days, sometimes every day, to have an app which you would scan to enter any public building or a taxi or an airplane. Um, and it had to show that you were negative. Uh, I can uh, and, and of course, if you were not negative, uh, then there were significant consequences for that. Uh, you would not necessarily be able to just go home and take some Advil. Uh, in fact, lots of people ended up having to go to centralized quarantine facilities, uh, very uncomfortable. And of course, some people got severely sick and passed away. So this, the existence of zero COVID and the, the policy to, to respond to the pandemic really was dominating for everyone I saw. And of, of course, for my own, own trip, not just the quarantine, but every day, I had to get up and stand outside my hotel to test and had to wait for the results and all of, all of those things. The first two years of the pandemic, I think what, in talking to my Chinese friends, they were willing to basically accept all of the restrictions that came with, with responding to COVID, including limited international travel for them to go abroad or for uh, people to visit China. But since last spring uh, and the Shanghai lockdown, uh, people lost patience and became increasingly frustrated and I did not run into anybody who said, this is a great policy. I did hear people say, we have no choice because if we open things up, uh, everyone would get COVID and there'd be a disaster and we'd lose a lot of lives. But for the, in general, people were upset with their circumstances. Uh, the inconvenience was more than an inconvenience uh, because uh, of 
the unpredictability and uncertainty of what would happen each day, and then when all of this would end. That uncertainty about the future dominated uh, my conversations uh, with people. People did, uh, and I would say in Shanghai, when I was there, people weren't just angry, they were traumatized. Uh, this is September, October last year, only a couple months after the end of the Shanghai lockdown, and people were still uh, trying to get themselves back to normal. Uh, and people, when you talk to them, they would talk too loud or they would talk too quietly. They would either be right in my shoes or they'd be really far away. Uh, they would have stories to say, you know, tell me about things that they went through or their family members or friends that went through. Uh, a, a good friend of mine, uh, one of his colleagues passed away because she did not know how to use her cell phone to get help uh, and she ran out of food, which is, uh, you know, lots of stories uh, like that. Um, that sense of uncertainty really just pervaded uh, and, and anger really pervaded things. Uh, people obviously trying to find outlets uh, in, in leisure activities. And so I did have a chance to go out for meals with people, but no, none of the banqueting of before with big bottles of Baijiu and other types of things and the fanciest dishes, no one, no one ever did that. Uh, uh, people were spending more time with their families out on the street, you could see parents with their kids in parks. Um, people dress down compared to, I, I'm a big, I pay a lot of attention to shoes and socks. Uh, and, and I take pictures of it and I can show you my collection over 20 years of, of people's feet on the subway. And uh, in, in the Beijing subway, uh, I, I'm, I'm weird, yes, sorry. Um, any case, paying attention to these uh, shoes, people used to, the shoes were getting fancier and fancier and fancier. And this time they were getting, the, it was, they were, everyone's wearing sneakers uh, and casual clothes. Now these might've been expensive sneakers, but nevertheless, uh, it, was, it, was, it was hip to be casual uh, on, on this past trip. And that wasn't the way it was before. A lot more people exercising out in public, uh, a lot of people running. Running used to not be a, a popular pastime. You could, I could not, get out of my sight when I was walking around Beijing, someone who was running. If someone ran, then someone else would come. And it was really quite common. Actually, the, I, I think the air genuinely is better than it was 10 years ago as the air apocalypse. It's improved quite a bit. And I think that's not just in Beijing. I think it's in other cities. The water uh, was improved. I don't know if any of you know Northeastern Beijing, Third Ring Road, the Liang Ma He, uh, used to, just be a smelly, gross sewage dump, actually much nicer uh, with gondolas going through at restaurants and people walking around it. Um, I went and played golf uh, uh, as an excuse to go do something I like. Uh, and previously golf used to be a occasion for business people to hang out with officials and informally lobby. Um, still the private entrepreneurs there, no officials. Uh, and people liked doing playing golf because it was a time for them. They didn't have to pay attention to the rest of what was going on in the country. They could just be out there walking around. That sounds like very bourgeois or whatever. China's got a lot of bourgeois people who, who want to do that. Um, all of that adds up to, I think, you know, pe Chinese people's values are shifting. Uh, you might remember Evan Osnos' book, The Age of Ambition. It was just you go, 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 get ahead, bigger car, bigger house, bigger this, that, I think now what people want is a quote unquote good life that they define themselves um, that sounds a little more postmodern. Uh, and maybe I'm hanging out with too many people who like lattes, uh, but I really feel that that was a broader shift amongst at least the, the people that I, that I met. In terms of the economy, um, the economy, uh, technically speaking, stunk. Uh, I could not detect any signs uh, uh, or many signs of economic vitality. Um, consumers weren't consuming, they were saving their money. This was the rainy day. Uh, and so people were not uh, buying a lot, obviously not traveling. Uh, I talked to uh, investors uh, that are in private equity, uh, financial institutions, uh, and they were not investing in new projects because they didn't know what the future would bring not just with that particular project, but the economy as a whole. Generally speaking, investors also thought that they were now 
um, not part of the in crowd. And uh, one of them uh, told me uh, over dinner, uh, they are treating us like dogs. They want us to starve. Uh, this is very different from how they used to feel. Um, not that they had the run of the place, but that they had a significant amount of, of freedom. Uh, economic policy technocrats. Um, I've known a lot of economic, since I've studied Chinese economic policy making, industrial policy, as Dan said, you, I get to interview lots of technocrats over, over many years. Uh, and typically the line that I get overall, I could sum it up is, we got this. We have some politicians that say some stuff, things in people's daily, but don't worry, uh, economic technocrats, we know how economies run, we know how to make them successful, and we're good. I did not get that from anybody this time. Uh, instead, it was, we don't know what the future holds. We're not sure how policy is made or what it is gonna be. And um, we will try, but we just don't know. And I don't know if I'll have a job uh, next year. So a great deal of worrying uh, like I had never heard before on the folks that we historically have depended on for knowing that despite Marxist Leninist ideology, that this is a system that is run by people who are quite capable. Um, and those people didn't try to even try to reassure me. Um, there were uh, a few bright spots in the economy. Uh, I met with uh, a variety of tech firms, uh, startups, uh, particularly in AI. And uh, we had a round table and then a long conversation after as well over dinner. Uh, and these people are working on really cool things, things that as a political economy analyst, I don't fully understand. I'm a user of tech, I can't make tech. Uh, but the things that they were doing in various uh, areas of AI, perceptions AI, uh, moving products around ports artificially, uh, autonomous vehicle technology, uh, really uh, quite interesting. But uh, they were worried that technology restrictions from the US and others were going to make them eventually make it very difficult for them to continue to progress and compete in China or globally. In fact, the further you go down the system, the more anxieties they were about these restrictions. In autos in particular, I was hugely impressed by the variety of different kinds of electric vehicles uh, that I came across. All kinds of brands, things I had never heard of. And I've written two reports about this industry, but I was just deeply impressed. This is uh, very vibrant. And last year, China's 26% of all, all, all cars that were sold were electric. I think we're under 5% still. It's Tesla and nobody else really still. Um, and that was amazing. Autonomous vehicles. Uh, there is lots of testing going on all over China. It used to be Chinese would test in Irvine, California, and in Phoenix, Arizona, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and now they're testing a lot all over China. And I was lucky enough, uh, you may not think so, to ride in an autonomous vehicle uh, on, the, on Shanghai raised roads, uh, Shanghai auto car, Momenta technology, and um, there was a driver who kept their hands near the steering wheel, but not on the steering wheel. And around Shanghai, we drove. Um, and I'm standing here and it went okay. So um, I don't know if that reaffirms that it's great technology, but they're in the game. They're in the game. Uh, nevertheless, uh, auto industry needs still depends on massive subsidies uh, in order to grow. Uh, and so they're still spending a lot. This is not a self-sustaining market. Uh, and of course, they need high-end chips uh, the further they move along, uh, particularly for autonomous vehicles. And as the, as the US restrictions grow, uh, that will be constraining uh, for, for China. Politics um, was quite um, concerning for me, um, partly because most of the people I talked to had no clue what was going on. I don't know, you got, you got some people here who are reporters, they've reported in China, you interview people, you ask all sorts of questions and you say, you know, who's gonna be the next group of Politburo members and someone's gonna tell you. 
and they're gonna say, you know, how'd you learn? And they'll, they might tell you, or they'll say, just depend on, you know, trust me. Nobody did that. So I had plenty of opportunities to ask people, you know, what's happening in elite politics. And the consistent answer was, I have no clue. It wasn't that they were keeping stuff from me. It was that they had no clue. Uh, as Chinese elite politics is far more buttoned up and opaque than, it, than it's before. And before it was never really easy uh, either. Um, so people might say, well, uh, if they offered guesses, it was here who I hope is gonna be on the Politburo Standing Committee or here who I fear will be on the Standing Committee. Um, I think people's general perception is that there's one person in charge and uh, they call the, all the shots. And if, as you look at the 20th Party Congress results and process, that seems to be the case at the elite level. Uh, ideology, way more visible in conversations with, with people. Um, not that everyone believes uh, Xi Jinping thought and all the things that come with it, but the need to perform. So I was at one uh, meeting where, and I hadn't, I hadn't experienced this before. I'm not, I'm old, but I'm not quite old enough. Uh, I, so I never got this during the Mao era. But um, one person began every sentence of their comments at our meeting with Xi Jinping says, Xi Jinping says, like 10 Xi Jinping says, and then on and on. And I thought, you're doing a really good job. You get a lot of social credit points there for all of those good comments. Uh, and that was the point of citing Xi Jinping so often. Again, not didn't happen all the time, but that it would happen and no one would be like laughing on the floor that they were doing that tells me that there's a different kind of conversation about and people's interaction with politics. My sense broadly is, is Xi Jinping's social contract that he's offering people uh, is party rule in return for security and order. And that for some people that is totally fine and they'll take that. Uh, but for a lot of people, that's inconsistent with their vision of themselves and their and where they sit in the world. And people want a broader life, uh, more complex life. Uh, and I think that explains why we got protests in late November and December, because people don't like that deal. Uh, and these were widespread protests on a common issue across the country uh, in 70 plus universities uh, and outside universities. I wouldn't have predicted the protests given how strong this political system is and how, how hard they can bring down the hammer on people. And, but that it did occur, uh, that shows uh, to me uh, the way people think about themselves and their relationship with the state has evolved in, in ways inconsistent with Xi Jinping's vision of how the, he wants um, that relationship to run. Um, I don't know why they decided to end zero COVID in five minutes. That is a huge question. Um, I mean, I know why they didn't, um, you know, change from zero COVID uh, earlier on. They wanted to wait for the 20th Party Congress and not upset that possibility of something going wrong there. And I knew that they were planning uh, to exit gradually, but why they did it in five minutes, I have no idea. It's a, a big, big, it's my biggest question mark trying to understand what's going on in, in Chinese politics. Um, foreign life in China. Um, this is probably not gonna be surprising, but it still deserves mention because it was so um, different from my previous experience. Uh, we all know travel between China and the rest of the world up until a couple of weeks ago has been down dramatically over 95%. Uh, I met, uh, you know, I am, I like to hang out because I do government business relations and, and do research on economic policy, I hang out with uh, you know, people that worked in multinational companies or do. Um, and a lot of these people are now expat refugees. Uh, they live in the United States, Europe, Canada, uh, and they have not traveled back uh, to China. For some, it was a choice not to travel, but for some, they could not travel back. I met a lot of the people who stayed behind, who still now work in, in multinational, still in China. And um, life for them is very different than it used to be. The people that they spend time with, the type of work that they do, who they talk to, 
And a lot of those people ask themselves, why am I still here? And most of them give answers which have to do with that they have kids that are in school in China or their partner has a good job or for one person, they want to be witness to what is happening and they did not want to just get up and leave. Another group uh, are the Chinese staff that work for multinationals in China uh, that do government affairs or other jobs. I mean, multinationals are largely Chinese employees anyway, but uh, we don't recognize that. If you think it's P&G and it's a bunch of Americans in China, it's not, or Apple or Intel or name your American company. Um, and since I've been doing research on government business relations and lobbying, the vast majority of people that lobby in a country are people from that country, including uh, in China. Most of these are former officials um, in central or local government. And those people, when I met them, were excited to see me uh, because we hadn't seen each other in so long. And they were, uh, they had, in their relaying, they felt ignored by headquarters or not trusted by headquarters. And when they go interact with their counterparts, their former colleagues in government, uh, they're seen as disloyal traitors. Uh, so really um, uh, very difficult circumstance. I felt bad for, for them because they're really between a rock and a hard place. Foreign tourists, zero, zero foreign tourists in China. You could not get a tourist visa to go to China if you, if you wanted. And if you wanted, people would think you're absolute crazy, right? So I, I encountered no buses of tourists or backpackers anywhere I went. Um, three to 400 American students on the ground in China last fall, uh, according to uh, the US embassy. Very small number at the Hopkins Nanjing Center. Most were still in Taiwan. I don't know if they've moved back. Schwarzman program in Beijing, maybe 40 Americans, uh, a larger group of international students, but that's it. Uh, NYU and Shanghai, the largest group of, of Americans, uh, but three to 400, that's how many were in China when I was a student in 1988, right? That, a continental sized country, a billion people, and only, you know, previously there was 11,000 at the, at the height. So it's gone from 11,000 to three to 400. Um, why would you want to study in China? A lot of people ask themselves if, and if students aren't asking, their parents are asking. Um, and so um, this, in short, uh, China felt a lot more isolated. Um, and that's a, a, re a response to zero COVID. It's a, res it's a anxiety that people felt following the, uh, two, the tension of the two Michaels, uh, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor. And so uh, there's a phrase going around among some Chinese that they live in a place called Xi Chaoxian, West, Korea, West North Korea. Um, and um, it's not that, uh, and, and so I, and people find that un unsettling. Um, most worrying um, was, uh, the discussions about US-China relations that I, that I had with people. I had plenty of substantive disagreements with people about all sorts of topics. What should the international order be? Uh, Russia, Ukraine, Taiwan, the role of government in the economy, lots of different issues we disagreed with. But what, I, what really bothered me wasn't these substantive disagreements, which are problematic and you all could, we could all role play and do one side or the other in almost any one of these conversations. It was the broad echo chamber or consensus in the, to use a polite term that I encountered. Um, not everyone had these opinions. Uh, some people did not, some people are really uh, disaffected, but the folks that make policy uh, for China and the advisors that they most likely listen to, I think have a general consensus. Um, around several things. First of all, um, the motives of the United States. As they see it, the motives of the United States is to undermine the rule of the Communist Party and keep itself on top as the world's sole superpower with no near peer. They blame the United States entirely for the decline in the relationship. And for them, that story begins in 2016. Pre-2016, 
relationship was just fine. And then along comes Trump who messes everything up. Uh, trade war, attacks on Huawei, a uh, bunch and bunch of restrictions closing the Houston consulate, kicking out Chinese journalists. And Biden has just continued. And it's all America's fault. China is to blame zero. China is just responding as it must. And so uh, you've heard of Chinese foreign policy, Tao Guang Yang Hui, right? Hold your cards, bide your time, right? Uh, Chinese pol foreign policy now, I think, uh, can be summed up by the phrase, woman bu de bu. We cannot but, we have no choice but to. You do X, therefore we have no choice but to respond with Y. And I heard that again and again. So totally blaming the US, China being blameless. On the scoreboard, who's winning? Most people I met, uh, particularly those closer to policymaking authority, think China's winning. Zero COVID's not great for China, but it's a speed bump on the longer path of China's inevitable rise and America's inevitable decline. As someone told me, the only problem with the relationship is the United States does not admit that it that China is a rising power and the US is a declining power. If it would just admit that, everything would be fine. Um, credibility. Most people I met don't think the Biden administration or the US government has any credibility when it comes to trying to reassure China or make commitments on anything. First, they, as I said, they question their motives, but they, they said, even if they would reach an agreement, well, that means uh, well, Congress would undo it, just as they, you know, sent Pelosi. You know, Pelosi went to Taiwan, and you know, the president can't even control people in his own political party. Obviously, he's not a good member of the Communist Party because we can. Um, so they're really worried about the ability, inability of the president to control Congress. And so the administration's reaction on the Pelosi visit was, "We have separation of powers." That is not reassuring to people in Beijing. If it's not Congress, then it's the future. The next election or the election after that, uh, Chinese are worried that there's no longer any consensus in American politics about the relationship with China. And so even if the Biden administration decided they wanted to build guardrails and have a stable relationship, the next administration would undo it. Um, and that you can't count on the US long-term. As a result, this uh, people, uh, had a sense of resignation and fatalism about the trajectory of the relationship. Uh, and that was reinforced by their estrangement. Uh, this inability to put themselves in America's shoes and really think about why others might question what China's been, been doing. Um, and so uh, that was really worrying that sort of that consensus was very, very difficult uh, to break. Now, in the last few minutes, let me say a little bit about things since the trip and whether we're seeing an about face and if so, um, where things may go. Obviously, there have been a few changes in China uh, since uh, the fall. Uh, they ended zero COVID uh, in early December. And so that means the whole testing and scanning regimen disappeared. Uh, People can travel within the country and are traveling within the country. So, uh, you know, rail traffic, domestic flight traffic is up, subway ridership is up. You know, so they basically ended their, their war footing to deal with uh, COVID. Uh, now, but people's hangover from that has, has not disappeared and people's concerns about the government haven't disappeared. On the economy, uh, I think they have engaged in what I would call modest tinkering to try and revive economic growth without making any significant concessions uh, or fundamental changes in the direction of policy. So they have officially ended the you know, campaign against social media companies in China. They have increased access to a few sectors for foreign direct investment. They have taken uh, some restrictions away from the housing market to allow people to buy a second property. But nevertheless, they are still emphasizing technology self-sufficiency. There is still an effort to expand uh, Chinese Communist Party influence in firms through party committees, uh, corporate social credit scoring, 
through special shares, uh, that uh, goes on. In politics, Xi Jinping, full clean sweep of the 20th Party Congress, uh, and he is you know, changing the rest of the leadership. And in a few weeks, we will see Li Qiang uh, be named as premier. Um, and Li Qiang got that job because he did such a good job following Xi Jinping's instructions. It, the results didn't matter other than that he followed Xi Jinping's instructions. Uh, you might have seen yes, uh, in the past couple of days, Xi Jinping's remarks to central committee members talking about the importance of Chinese style modernization and that modernization doesn't equal westernization uh, and the importance of struggle. This is really China's admission, which I think they've met before, that we've got a systematic competition going on. Foreign related life. I think, yes, there will be uh, more people going back to China, perhaps uh, more students, uh, some business people. Uh, I think with the China Development Forum in March, you'll see uh, an increase in the number of, of travelers. But I think it's very unlikely for us to see a return to pre-pandemic levels of international travel uh, across most of those categories. China is considered a hardship post now, and I don't think that's going to change for a while. Chinese official views about the US and the West, I don't think they've changed one, one iota uh, from where they were uh, last year. Um, and if they were beginning to shift, the balloon incident simply has eliminated that. And that is all I want to say about balloons, unless you all really want to talk about balloons. All right. What are the implications for all this? And I'm uh, sorry to, to drone on way too long like a, a professor. Um, all the professors here talk very briefly. But if you were at Indiana University, you would have gone on and on, right? So this is maybe a Midwest versus East Coast thing. Anyway, uh, so I still think, you know, China is, has not made, Xi Jinping has not made a new about face. I think he's still pursuing a highly authoritarian state capitalist approach to governing their society. I still think they're focused on, a, uh, you know, competing and struggling uh, with the United States and the West, uh, and concessions mean weakness and, uh, and potentially a threat to the party as they define it. And I don't think that they're going to back off on that. Um, what's Washington's response? Uh, mirrored. That echo chamber I described for China, motives, et cetera. You find that in Washington. I live and breathe that, swim in that every single day. So. China's motives are out to, you know, they're out to replace the U.S. It's entirely Xi Jinping's fault. Uh, the U.S. is winning. Uh, we can't trust Xi Jinping. No credibility, fatalism as well. The whole, the whole thing. Uh, that's um, uh, deeply concerning, and I think this is uh, infecting local and state governments around the United States. So look at the number of legislatures uh, that are adopting legislation related to Chinese buying property or control of you know, TikTok and all of those things. We're seeing a real shift in the US nationally. If I have some sources of optimism, and I'd like to end on someone, because I've, I've been a, a downer, and I try not to be the, the, the most pessimistic person in any room. Uh, so why do I, why should there be some optimism, or at least what are sources of potential optimism? First, I would say the most important thing is the Chinese people themselves. Uh, I think 40 years of evolution under reform and opening created, an created uh, a view of the world and expectations uh, which can't easily be undone. And I think I saw a continued evolution of that when I was in China and the people I met and, and spoke with. And I think those are, are the folks who will put the biggest brakes on a uh, overly radical shift in domestic China and China's relationship with the rest of the world. And I think that explains, you know, ending zero COVID, I would give credit to uh, the Chinese people, not uh, Xi Jinping. I think also um, this leadership, we could say is more ideological, more focused on their, themselves maintaining power, but they are not oblivious to failure. Uh, they don't like making monster mistakes. And I think China will, adjust, not as 
well as they've done in the past, but I think they do not want their economy to collapse. I don't think they want wars with their neighbors or the U.S. People-to-people -people ties, I think, are really important. Um, and uh, the ability of Chinese to travel globally, for others to go to China, for us to meet, uh, to talk to each other, I think that is really critically important. And I'm hopeful that those bonds expand dramatically. Lastly, my other source of, of hope for optimism are China's East Asian allies, um, Taiwan, the ROK, Japan, the places I visited um, in the spring, I was amazed at the level of internal social cohesion, so high social trust, uh, healthy political economies. They were able as a result to manage COVID far better than the United States. Um, and I think they have a more healthy idea of how to manage the relationship with China. Uh, they see China as threat, threatening and dangerous, but they're not fearful of interdependence the way the United States is. Uh, and they see advantages of being connected to China that also help protect them as a, both a commercial and a national security benefit. Um, and they've dealt with China for so long that, uh, and they have memories. Uh, and sometimes in Washington, you are worried that people have amnesia. So I think, uh, although I think that Washington is doing some good, making some right moves on China um, that are important, uh, I credit our friends in the region for probably being able to be even more constructive uh, than we are. And of course, most importantly, uh, the Chinese people. So let me stop there and look forward to your feedback. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Scott. I'm gonna ask, uh, take moderator's prerogative and ask a, a couple questions, but please have your questions ready and raise your hand. Scott will acknowledge questioners and our colleague will pass a mic. Please wait till you have a mic to speak so that uh, everyone watching online can, can hear you. But I wanna ask about two um, areas which have traditionally been a uh, cause for optimism in the US-China relationship. The first is investment. And investment doesn't like uncertainty. You talked a lot about policy uncertainty. Uh, my understanding is there's still quite a bit of enthusiasm in the EU for investment in China. What do you foresee for the United States? in this regard. And the second is higher education. I, I'm very uh, concerned that we only have 300, 400 students on the ground right now and what that means for our understanding of China moving forward. Uh, what did you hear about uh, enthusiasm and um, willingness to engage in higher education academic exchange in China? And I'll, I'll, I'll let you answer and then we'll go right into uh, audience questions. Sure. Um, well, thanks, Dan. Uh, those are two good questions to begin with. I would say in terms of investment, um, foreign investment in China overall, um, I think broadly speaking, uh, China is no longer seen for most global companies as the big giant future market of the world around which they would orient all of their global production and supply chains and as their target market. It is a, an important market, but not mo more important than everything else. Uh, they know that there are just too many things that they can't control themselves. They can't control American policy or what the US can do to its allies in terms of restrictions. Uh, they are unclear what Xi Jinping will do. They are unclear about the top possibility for war. You then have pandemics, climate change, and other things. And I, I think as a result of all of those, you're seeing significant adjustments, including in the way that uh, European businesses do investment. And I spent time with European companies, the EU Chamber of Commerce in Beijing and Shanghai. Um, and I think there is great anxiety amongst all of them. As a result, I broadly saw a, you know, if you look at all the surveys of European American companies and others, um, they, uh, China ranks lower than it had been, and they are not putting as much money in or they are dividing their global supply chains, China plus one or regional strategies, uh, China for China, and then the rest of the world for the rest of the world. Uh, we did a survey that came out uh, in early October as actually in China when my, our survey of Taiwanese companies came out and I held an event for this report when I was in China. 
uh, no one came into my room and arrested me or anything. I was able to talk about Taiwan as you know, foreign investment. And uh, Taiwanese companies are more anxious than everybody. Uh, and so we found that 59% either were considering moving some of their business or had already started, uh, which is a very high number. And of course, that comes right on the heels of the Pelosi. We, our survey ended the day before Pelosi landed in, in Taipei. Uh, we're doing it again soon, so we'll have have updated numbers. I think great anxiety. So, and this is and it's funny uh, when I went back to the U.S. I went to New York. The conversation in New York that people ask me is, is China investable? I, I, I was like, what? What do you mean is China inv-? like? I can't believe that's even a question people ask. But enough people were asking, and I think it divides between sort of financial folks who are at arm's length, who can push a button and money can move in or money can move out, who are worried about returns in China suddenly evaporating uh, versus folks that have long-term plans. So I think uh, long-term folks are not leaving, they're not decoupling, but they're uh, uh, reorganizing their global business. And they they're wanna make sure that if something goes bad in China or with the rest of the world, it doesn't crater the rest of their global business. So I, I, I saw, I think that's all the way up to C-suites uh, ar- around the world. I've, and I, we talked to a bunch of companies uh, in Washington who come to Washington and every single one are making plans or they've already made plans. Uh, if they didn't, uh, it's malpractice. Um, in terms of education, um, you know, on the Chinese side, uh, I think they would be thrilled to have more American students and foreign students go back. Um, I think they thought, well, we've got this zero COVID policy and we've got to implement that and everyone else has to align. And if foreign programs decided not to send students and students didn't wanna go, well, that was partly our choice. I think that, so I think the question partly is, what will we do to revive interest in China and make sure that we can reassure the students and their families that going to China entails the same kind of risks of going any other place. And I think that's a, that's a high bar uh, to do. And I, I don't think that we're, we're there yet. Uh, I am really, really worried uh, of all the people, of all the groups I talked about, uh, I'm most worried that there were so few young people, uh, foreigners in China, because they are the next generation of, of China experts and China watchers. They are the glue of, of the relationship. I am impressed that uh, even though uh, the number of Chinese students in the United States has dropped, I believe it's still, it was 370,000 before the pandemic. I think now it's about 250,000 on the ground. And then I think there are a few, about 40,000 supposedly still taking classes online. So that's, uh, that's a significant drop. And we're gonna see more Chinese students go to Canada and Australia and Europe instead, which, um, as an American, I'd like more to, to want to come here first. Um, but I, I'm re- I really am most worried about what we're going to do to incentivize and give people a positive idea. Obviously, yes, China is really important and it's dangerous, so you need to understand. But most people, when they're picking you know, what language to study and where to go to study abroad, they're mostly looking about opportunities. And so you've got to create, at the end of the day, that's China's job to create an environment that looks welcoming. And I think young people are really, really smart. They know if it's a con game, right? If it's just all sweetness. And we know that China is more complicated. Uh, and the China, and so the question is, can China offer a realistic picture of what it's like to go there um, to attract students? I, and I hope they do. Hi, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Kennedy, um, because uh, it's deeply very related to my life because I'm Harry, I'm a, currently a master's student here, and I'm a graduate of both New York University, New York University Shanghai and Swartzman College. So, and I also live in Liangmahe region when you're there. <laughs> so I'm probably one of the runner when you actually visit there. Okay. So, so thank you so much for the, for the, for the talk, I really enjoy it. I also listened to your podcast uh, with Li Yuan uh, online. So my question is specifically about your visits with 
Vice Minister Xi, um, uh, who actually would pr probably becomes a Chinese ambassador to the U.S. And uh, I'm I, I have a particular question about uh, what do you perception in terms of the next generation uh, leaders like Minister Xi himself uh, of his uh, actions toward uh, his perceptions of U.S.-China relations. Uh, I know the the meetings is confidential, so I would more like to understand your perceptions in general uh, about their ideas that what can be done in terms of collaboration or what kind of conditions that we need to achieve for a future collaboration from the China side, from your perceptions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. That's a, a great question. Dan, do you want me to take one at a time or what's your preference? Okay, well, uh, well, that was a multi-part question. I want to answer that and then I'll, for the next, why don't we get a few, a, a couple at a time? and then and, and do it, uh, but I'm happy to adapt. Um, so, wow, you, you check every single box there. Um, that's unusual. And of course, if I had been in Beijing in November, a lot of the protests would have started outside my, my, my hotel, right in that intersection. So, um, but um, uh, yeah, so I would, I would also expect that Xie Feng will be mentioned, you know, named uh, Chinese ambassador to the United States. Uh, I think the ball's now in the American court to uh, approve that uh, proposal. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, I've met a whole range of foreign ministry officials that are of, of that era and also in other ministries of people around that similar rank. And these are people that have obviously very good language skills. They've traveled abroad. They've, most of them have lived in the United States. Um, and I think they have uh, sort of direct experience, which is useful in managing very practical issues. Um, I don't think they have a sense that the U.S. has a right to be a superpower or that China necessarily inevitably should be a superpower, that you have to earn these things. And I think that's good. Um, I, I, I think the question will be, will their bosses give them the freedom to uh, learn on the ground and travel around and talk to people? Uh, I know Ambassador Chin has come to Harvard before. He probably came multiple times. Uh, he spends a lot of time on both coasts. Um, what I've found is, is Chinese officials don't spend enough time just walking around, wandering around, meeting different kinds of ordinary people? Um, and then can they report back? Uh, my sense is uh, what they genuinely see and what they see is the most likely reactions to Chinese policies on X, Y, or Z. So I would hope that the folks in the Chinese embassy, for example, right now, uh, or in the different consulates would be saying, you know, here's what we're seeing with Americans reacting to the balloon incident, right? Um, or any particular Thing, or to the president's State of the Union speech where China was highlighted like never before. Um, and then how does, how does that information work its way into Chinese policy? Uh, will China adapt as a result uh, or do they, will they have a tin ear uh, and, and not uh, adjust? So I think the, you know, I think Chinese are, of, of Xie Feng's um, generation and, and yours are extremely knowledgeable and cosmopolitan. I just don't know if the system will effectively and pragmatically use all of that knowledge and information. So I think China's human talent wise is really strong. It's just, will the system effectively make use of, of that great knowledge? So we'll take a, a few at a time. So I saw uh, there's two gentlemen here. Yeah. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Um, can you explain that again one more time? Ah, excuse me. Uh, you would have, you would be Chinese, the same function you have 
now, you have now, but you would be Chinese looking for Chinese interests. Yes. What would you suggest to the high officials with whom okay. you would speak? I get that. Okay. Sorry, Scott, you were, uh, so you were uh, going to take both questions. I'll take, multiple, to, okay, I'll, take, gotcha. I'll take a group of them. Uh, yeah, so, uh, Scott, you mentioned uh, Xi Jinping's uh, speech uh, this week. Uh, apparently, uh, one of the things that he said uh, for the first time uh, was that China's uh, objective here uh, is to pursue a model that will uh, have greater economic efficiency uh, than the Western model. Uh, now, keeping in mind that Winston Lord uh, always used to say that a, uh, a China expert is an oxymoron or just a plain moron, uh, but you are a China specialist. I'm just, uh, you know, interested in your perspective. Do you think that the state-driven model that Xi Jinping is overseeing uh, has the recipe for success uh, to surpass the West or even to catch up to the likes of Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. Okay. Let's go for a couple more gentlemen there. Um, how has the relationship between the local governments in China and the central government changed throughout the past three years after having to shoulder quite a bit of cost for zero COVID? Thank you. Why don't we come up here to this lady in the front and then Dan's online question, and then we'll, we'll do the next round. Because I know there's a couple of people in the back who raised hands. Thank you very much for being here. So I'm a German student, MPA student here. I left China in 2016. I've also spent several years there. So it was very interesting to hear our calendar after post-216 today. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm interested in international development and climate change. And we continue talking about cooperating with China on these critical issues. And um, in fact, like because of a lot of the supply chains in renewable energies are basically uh, controlled by China. And due to the BRI, we see this huge influence in China in developing markets. Um, we actually need to cooperate with China. So I'm interested, uh, interested in your um, view on how this cooperation will look like and where it can actually still happen. All right, and a question online from uh, a professor at HBS. Do you have the sense that Beijing perceives itself to be dealing with a far more strategically competent rival in Washington than with the prior administration? If so, has that impacted at all Beijing's sense that US relative decline is inexorable? That's a great question. Okay, very good group of, of questions. Um, not easy, uh, which I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. Um, as, uh, I'll hold off on giving my proposals until I, because most of the other questions are sort of analysis. Um, but, you, and, and maybe this is connected. Um, certainly, uh, if we, an analytical question around the center local relations, um, my sense is, is that Xi Jinping has tried to expand the center's power. Uh, and give more responsibilities uh, without giving more authority to local governments. Uh, the biggest challenge for local governments is their fiscal weakness, right? And uh, uh, the tax system is basically decided by how much is split between Beijing and the localities, and that's in Beijing's favor. Uh, localities have resolved that problem by selling land or making other ways to, to raise money. Um, the true solution is uh, a different way of dividing tax revenue and also creating new tax sources of tax revenue, uh, most importantly, property tax. Um, and it's funny, you would, you know, maybe this goes back to, you know, the ending zero COVID in five minutes, but why is it that uh, Xi Jinping is supposed to be the next coming of Stalin can't implement a property tax? It's, it's, the, it's, it's, it's another puzzle. You know, uh, why did he end zero COVID and why is he doing uh, not not doing a property tax because you need fiscal solvency for localities to be able to provide all the things that they're required to do and all the things that in the future they will need to do. China has a very, very weak social wealth safety net that they need uh, to build. 
and that is going to be built through local local governments, not through uh, the the central government. Um, the uh, the bill for testing was amazing, uh, and uh, people would joke to me uh, that you know the, the you know, electric vehicle makers and test takers test were the ones doing well this past year. But I don't think actually the folks that implemented tests with it were making much money because no one was paying their bills by the end. Uh, this is very expensive. It's easy math to uh, come up with. Um, you know, I think in terms of US, uh, China's cooperation on climate, et cetera, I'm, um, I think at a commercial level, I think we will, see, we will continue to see China's still parts of supply chains you need um, a lot of the uh, rare earths and many other lithium and everything else uh, that the Chinese either mine or that they process. Uh, and the US and others are going are very slow about this. And I don't think that is gonna change quickly. I'm not super worried about that. I mean, there's always been this debate, will China block rare earths or block this or that? Um, and they, they could, but I think um, th there's just no getting around it. Uh, and so, um, for me, a lot of the, although cooperation is really important, if I was, if I had a wish list for one thing that sort of connects to your question, you know, China has said emissions will peak in 2030. What I would like them to do is tell me what that peak will be. What is that number that they will get? All they've said is we'll get there and then we'll turn down. If, if they really want to move the needle, if they, if they identified a number, a target, and kept to it, and it was a significant target. That would be uh, big. So actually, a lot, a lot of the things that are really important about reducing carbon emissions are thing, unilateral things that that countries can do. They don't all have to be tied to a negotiation where someone else does something. Uh, so now, um, if we do make those agreements, then there's just lots of of green industries uh, that we can work on in other ways that we can, you know, reduce plastics and other types of cons conservation elements, tree planting, uh, other other things that we can do to plant. I'm not super optimistic uh, about that, uh, but um, I think I think we, we could. I, I do notice, um, and this gets to the, another question, um, you know, Washington is just very suspect of Beijing's willingness to cooperate on things where they have to make significant concessions. Um, and so uh, even though, you know, uh, Secretary Kerry or Ambassador Kerry is doing a lot of this work. Others across the U.S. government are really skeptical. Um, the same thing comes up with public health, which is something that we've been trying to initiate ourselves. And there's just great worries that um, China won't. China will sit down at the table, will say that there are important goals, but not make significant concessions to, to get things done. I think Beijing's view is is the Biden administration is a smarter Trump administration. Uh, they're more organized, uh, more uh, they, uh, they've they've got plans. Whereas the Trump uh, Trump was um, you know would would make a lot of mistakes in that if you were friends with him or the right family member, you could get a lot done. Uh, and I think they saw Trump as a big gift to China. Uh, now, 2024, uh, would they want Trump again? Um, I, I don't, I think the Chinese typically don't think that way. They usually think, well, we'll figure out how to deal with the leader that is put in front of us. Uh, I think they're very unhappy with the Biden administration. Uh, ideas for, for China, that's, that's hard because uh, I'm a liberal. Uh, and so as a liberal, I've got lots of liberal American ideas about what the Chinese should do, like embrace rule of law, and uh, limited government and transparency um, and things like that. And that if they did, and um, less um, fear that the US is out to undermine them. Uh, I think both sides' perceptions of each other are overwrought. Um, I don't think the US's goal is to undermine China. Um, I think we could figure out how to get along. Uh, but there are things China is doing that are, are quite troubling. Um, so that paranoia, you know, if you could tone down the paranoia, I think that would help a lot. Um, but again, that's me speaking as an outsider. And um, I think most of, you know, that again, this is an internal conversation uh, for, the, for the Chinese to have. 
Um, I think that the same goes for economic policy uh, that one of the questioners asked about, uh, is China's model better? Well, uh, as Bill and others have written, you know, developmental states are really useful at certain stages of economic development. And when you need to catch up, um, interventionism uh, ain't bad. Um, and we and others have done that. It's just harder as you get to the technology frontier. Uh, and uh, because the choices aren't as obvious. Um, in addition, um, industrial policy in inherently creates opponents, uh, particularly outside your system when you're the scale of China, uh, adopting industrial policy that moves markets in China, but not just in China, but globally creates a lot of backlash. And so I, I think that is, that is challenging. And of course, even if you do choose choose to do industrial policy. You still have to have the right people. You still need to have a atmosphere of that it's right to question and offer proposals and make changes and adjust and adapt. And so um, right now I'm really worried that China is at the tech, you know, moving towards a technological frontier where choices are much more complicated uh, and where decision-making isn't as robust as it used to be uh, and where everything they do generates pushback from, from others. So um, all of those things suggest to me, you know, moving in a more humble direction in terms of industrial policy and management would probably get them significant progress uh, and less pushback from, from the world. You know, you know, Singapore might be a good model to, to look at to be a little bit more, more humble. So uh, I come up with suggestions for sort of be more a little more liberal, a little more humble, uh, if Washington could be a little more liberal, a little more humble, uh, with a, a little help, not with a, I'm not talking liberal conservative, uh, that we, we'd probably be in better shape. But again, you know, I work in a think tank, I'm not an academic, so I get to have policy preferences. So uh, next round. I think we have a, just done. a few more minutes. So okay. maybe if you want to round up one or two more questions and we'll, we'll ask people to keep, uh, keep their yeah. questions brief and, okay. uh, and we can answer All those. All right, so we'll get three. The gentleman standing in the back first and then here and then this this nice lady over here. Scott, thank you for uh, doing this presentation and, and a lot of what you said tracks with my experience. You spend a lot of time with elites when you're in China. How much interaction do you have with everyday people? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, this gentleman right here. The hood. Thank you so much. I get the sense that there's not a lot of voices in Washington that have a perspective like yours um, in terms of being interested in going over to the other side, talking to people directly, and kind of using that to inform a more cool headed analysis. Do you have like any ideas for a way forward to encourage more of that uh, on Washington side, whether it's like taking trips like yours or, or other strategies? Okay, good question. I'm sorry to make you run so far with the mic or Hi, I'm from Singapore. Um, so I'm very curious to know about what you think about um, overseas uh, sovereign lending. Um, there's a lot of opacity about this, especially to do with the BRI. And I've come up with some couple of reports, especially from the eight data people. So these are very recent reports, 2021, 2022. And they highlight um, contracts that they've looked at within uh, with the BRI projects and also outside in terms of Chinese sovereign lending overall. They've seen clauses, for example, policy clauses that could be uh, triggered, so it could be triggered by the creditor country, uh, and then it, then the, what it means is that um, they could uh, then terminate the contract and then demand immediate repayment. So that's actually an issue. That's actually an issue because eighty percent of the BRI projects are collateralized, so with assets. And what does it mean then uh, in terms of security? So I, I disagree with some of the analysis by Chatham House where they tried to divorce the economic implications from the security implications. I'm a I was a diplomat before. Um, so I just wanted to get your thoughts on that about what this means because there are now data that shows um, some of these contracts and, and what it means in terms of um, security wise uh, for, the con for the African continent. Um, well, thanks for the questions. And again, whatever we didn't get to today, let's, let's follow up. I would say uh, going uh, with your question first, I'm not an expert on the BRI. Uh, I would say there's sort of, you know, sort of fuzzy strategy here that uh, the BRI is partly just a good advertising idea. Uh, certain ministries liked it and then it spread. Uh, others uh, then signed on to it. 
uh, different officials have tried to use it uh, both uh, to promote Chinese economic interests and diplomatic interests. Um, I think the BRI is about as efficient as China's own domestic financial system, which I don't think is very efficient. And so makes lots of different kinds of mistakes um, and generated a lot of uh, pushback. I think we're now about 10 year anniversary of, of the BRI. So I think we'll see a, a media reporting on it and taking stock of it. It's, uh, uh, I think, sort of three phases. It was sort of an original bureaucratic idea uh, about how China could uh, technologically upgrade by moving uh, sunset industries abroad. Then it became a political tool to promote China and infrastructure and connections with the West, uh, potentially an alternative to the WTO. Whatever. And, and then China ran into its own domestic financial troubles, uh, political backlash, uh, fears about debt traps, you know, reports about Sri Lanka and, and things. So it's, it's, a, it's now a shell of its former self. And um, I think it's, you know, it's a ho hopefully a learning opportunity for everybody, uh, which is originally what I thought it was going to be. I thought AIB and the Belt and Road was a chance for China to play in a sandbox of global governance where they could have some room to try some things given that they are a successful economic developer. Um, but it went from being a back page story to a front page story and generating a lot of heat. And I think in some ways that's uh, the consequence of China's own advertising campaign to highlight the importance of it and then our reaction. So we pushed each other's buttons. Uh, and so it, it became something that it probably wasn't intended. Um, and, you know, we have a huge development infrastructure gap that we need. China's got a lot of money, a lot of smart people, um, could be extremely useful. Uh, I don't think we're at a point now, I did hear in China lots of suggestions for collaboration on infrastructure investment internationally. I don't think you're gonna see that from the US or Japan or others who've come up with their alter a variety of alternatives like the Blue Dot Network and other things. But um, it's a, I look forward to seeing what you, what you write and, and, and others analysis. On um, everyday people in China, um, I mean, I am who I am, and I spend time with who I can. And I, I'm not sure what the how to define everyday versus non-everyday. Uh, and I'm typically when I go to China, I will land in Beijing and then immediately try to go someplace else. Uh, I will go to other cities because mostly I spend time looking at companies and how effective they are. And of course, companies aren't you know, there's not the workers and, and things like that. So I, I don't get a full picture. Um, so, but something is better than nothing. Uh, we published a report a year ago about public opinion surveys in China by two Stanford professors, uh, uh, Jen Pan and uh, Xu Yiqing, uh, who looked at lots of surveys and they find a variety of opinions on all sorts of things, economics, politics, foreign policy amongst Chinese. But, uh, Yes, I need to go to more provinces, go to the countryside, uh, hang out on street corners and just talk to passerbys and et cetera. Um, uh, and it would be nice, yes, if more people from DC and other places went. I, I think the uh, reason why there's, you know, so, so I, I think there is maybe an assumption amongst some that those who pursue traveling and highlight its importance are sort of like pro-engagement uh, and therefore likely to be duped and tricked and or just come back saying all positive things. And what I've tried to emphasize about my trip is that um, having more information is better than being ignorant. Whether you want to expand cooperation or whether you think China's uh, the greatest evil empire uh, and whether you think we're bound for uh, conflict, uh, we e even a hawk ought to be a smart smart hawk, uh, and you can learn a lot about official policy, about how it's explained. You can explain American policy and try and uh, address uh, misperceptions they have about American policy by trying. So I've tried to explain that sharing more information is not necessarily pro or anti any one policy position, uh, but I think that's hard for folks. I would say also. Um, China's not made it easy to travel. A lot of people are very busy and they are concerned. Uh, you know, if, if uh, the case of the two Michaels really has made a lot of people worried. Uh, now, and um, so I, I think that all those things explain why travel and interest is, is 
declined. Um, uh, Deb Selixson at Villanova uh, went in uh, late October. She actually was arriving on the plane that I took when I left Shanghai. She stayed till early January. So she lived through the exit of zero COVID when she was at Tsinghua and, and, and traveled a, a little bit. Uh, Craig Allen from the US China Business Council was there for several weeks. Um, a couple hours, actually I'm hosting them on a program tomorrow morning to talk about their trips. Uh, so people, that's online, people can watch it online if they want. Um, I think we will see more travel um, uh, and, and I hope we do. Um, and I hope the Chinese take whatever steps are necessary to reassure people that their trips will uh, be unimpeded. Thanks. That, yeah, please join me in thanking Scott Kennedy. Thank you, Scott, that was excellent. Uh, thank you all for being here today. And uh, if you sign up for our e-newsletter or join us on Twitter, you'll be able to hear about more programming like this. Thank you much, so much, Scott. Thanks.